Hey y'all, so I decided to make this documentary just one night I was in my bed, it was 2 a.m., scrolling through Twitter, saw some stuff that I didn't really like, and I was like, why not speak on it, you know? I always tell myself, you know, that I've wanted to do things, you know? I've always wanted to create something to this magnitude that expresses my sentiments on a issue. And yes, while I do have like my channel and I do do things on social media, it is not the same as actively going out there and looking for content, searching for content and compiling it all together and sharing your findings. So here I am to share with you all my findings on what I'd like to call misogynoir, it's past and it's present. I think that people like to downplay Sometimes the effect and the impact that their words have on other people. For black women, there is a large history of misogynoir that happens not only with this in this country, but also around the world. And for some people, it might seem like isolated incidents. They might say, oh, you're being a bit too sensitive. That's not what they meant. That's not what they wanted you to feel like, you know, but this documentary is going to show you otherwise. But first and foremost, what exactly is misogynoir? Misogynoir by definition is misogyny directed towards black women where race and gender both play roles in bias. The term was coined by queer black feminist Moya Bailey, who created the term to address misogyny directed toward black women in American visual and popular culture. This is played throughout history from the enslavement of African women and their bodies being used as attractions at zoos to today where even the most high profile of black women are subjected to attacks on their appearance simply because their phenotypes are rooted in their blackness. The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. The most unprotected woman, uh, person in America is the black woman. The most neglected person in America is the black woman. And as so how did we get to this documentary today? While I scrolled through Twitter, I never failed to see disparaging comments towards black women partaking on the timeline, but one particular day really set me off. There were comments being made towards Tiana Taylor and Ari Lennox, two prominent black women who are in the music industry, referring to them as being Rottweilers. Naturally, many people spoke out against the sentiment, such as Jackie Ina, a prominent figure in the beauty industry. These types of comments are typically made towards darker skinned black women with more Afrocentric features, sometimes more muscular features too, like Serena Williams, Meg Thee Stallion, and Michelle Obama. Not only that, but I also saw some comments made towards Blue Ivy Carter, the famous daughter of Beyonce and Jay-Z. Here, a black man and white woman came together to attack Blue Ivy for inheriting her father's more Afrocentric features. This isn't the first time that Blue has come under attack, People often refer to Jay-Z as less conventionally attractive, and when Blue was first born and growing up, there are numerous comments praying for her to not look like her father when she is a beautiful young black girl. Oftentimes, misogynoir starts at a young age. Whether young black girls are made fun of for their features or hair, there is a commonality amongst them begging their moms to help fix how they look when it's not needed. My name is Aliyah Kimmy. I'm 19 years old. I go to Temple University. I'm a sophomore here and I'm a journalism major. Um, I'm from Allentown, PA. I was originally born in Boston, but my younger years were spent in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> I'm Sierra Henderson and my major is graphic design. My year is a sophomore, a sophomore. And I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My name is Nahara. Um, I'm from Harrisburg. I'm a computer science major here at Temple. I'm a freshman. I'm Tiana. I am from Virginia. I was born in Georgia. Um, I'm a military brat, so I've lived all along the East Coast and Japan. I'm a freshman at Temple University. I'm studying history and Italian. My name is Zainab, um, but everybody just calls me Zane. I am a senior biology with teaching major, and I'm from Magnolia, Delaware. Okay. So, as I mentioned, I used to live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, then I moved into Allentown, and the suburbs of Allentown is a predominantly white area, and my mother's black and my father's white. Um, my hair when I was younger, I have curly hair. Right now it's in braids, a protective style. When I was younger, my hair used to be in cornrows, like the braids with the, the, braids with the bees, things like that. And when I lived in Brooklyn, 
other little girls, other little black girls' hair was like that. So it was nothing special, it was nothing different. When I moved to Allentown, I was the only black girl in my class. I was like the first black friend per se that a lot of the little other kids had had. And they didn't know that they were being like, um, having like microaggressions towards me or like mm -hmm. making me feel a certain type of way. But everybody else around me had straight hair, blonde hair. Their hair didn't curl like mine. No one else's hair was in braids. And if they were in braids, you could tell the difference between my type of cornrows and the braids that the little white girls had. You know what I mean? So they'd want to feel my hair. They'd be like, oh my God, you're so different, whatever. And I was just like, okay, cool. And it didn't really like bother me until I started like feeling towards myself. I want straight hair or mom, can I come home? I want to straighten my hair. Like what is it going to take for me to have the same hair as everybody else? And it wasn't so much as like, oh, my skin color is different because you know, I wasn't the only person of color. Like there were, there were, there was other people, Hispanic people. Um, there were Asian like kids, like, I was the only black girl in my class, you know? Mm -hmm. And while there are other people of color, like I was the only black girl. I was the only one with hair that was the way that mine was. And that was the first time I ever realized I was black. Mm -hmm. Because when you're surrounded by black people, like in Brooklyn, the predominantly black area, when you're surrounded by black people, you see all races. Brooklyn has all races. It's not just black people. There's white people, Asian people, Hispanic people, you know, people of all like different backgrounds. But going into a predominantly white neighborhood, you realize that you're not the same as everybody else. And being a young age, like, I might have been, like, second grade, and I realized that, like, pretty quickly after I moved there, so. I would say probably, like, that goes back to kindergarten, first grade, second grade. I remember definitely being, um, like, excluded from groups. Um, I was at a school, it was a private school when I was at that age that um, was not really diverse at all. Um, so I definitely, I remember being like made fun of, mostly, it was mostly my hair, it was a big thing, people made fun of me for my hair growing up then. Um, I'd say it just continued from then, yeah. I didn't, I think, put like a, I didn't fully understand it until I think a few years later, I like, um, realized what it was, mm -hmm. or like the type of, um, yeah, that it was about my color until later. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was just one time that I went to a 7-Eleven, I was back at home, and there was this lady who was ringing out me and my stepmom, and I had my slushie in my hand because you know how like slushies at 7-Eleven, you have to hold them until like, you know, they ask for it. So she thought we were stealing them, and she started attacking us, and we were like, whoa, whoa, like, hold on, like, what are you doing? Like, why are you like coming for us? Like, we was about to pay for this, like, you didn't give us a chance. And she started saying to this one guy who was white and he was trying to like defend us. And she was like, you're my kind, you're my kind, you should be on my side. And I'm like, yo, like this is really crazy. Like I'm really getting called out because of my, like how I look and like really feeling belittled. I felt so belittled. And that was like my first experience with that like ever happening to me like that was so dramatic mm -hmm. and i was like really scared to be honest and after that i never went back to that 7-eleven again and we got her fired so that was great <laughs> um so in fourth grade uh we were talking about slavery and what that meant in the caste system color wise <clears throat> and um we were in we were doing re we were playing in recess and uh you know, like the girls were like, oh my god, like he likes you, he likes you. And you like have to like go and like make sure that they like him so they can like date or not. So they were doing that and I asked him and he was like, well, why are you so black? Insert N word. And um, I slapped him <laughs> and I was suspended for a day and he got a slap on the wrist like saying like, oh my goodness, are you okay? What's in our office? Did I hit him? Sure did. Because, you know, at least in my family, when they say when someone says something rude to you, because like we're taught from a young age, like, the expectations of being a black person in America as a young age, you hit him back and tell him was good. So I did that. And um, after that incident, my dad was, uh, he was done with deployment. So that was his first weekend back. And imagine like getting back and your daughter was suspended for hitting someone for standing up for herself. And uh, he forced me to watch the movie Roots. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned that in there, like, I have to be aware of my surroundings and how to react to that. So now I will do it more appropriately so I won't like hit someone. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so I would say the first time probably wasn't until I was like 10 years old. 
So I moved to Delaware when I was nine. Um, prior to that, I lived all over Maryland, mostly in Prince George's County. So like everyone in PGC looks like me. <laughs> like it's a very urban um, community. So moving to Delaware where there's literally cornfields everywhere that you pass, honestly, if you're not near the highway. Um, being in my school, I would say like my fourth grade class, I was probably one of like, 10 max <laughs> black kids and then when I got to high school like it just got even worse it literally was just it wasn't a lot of representation at all mm -hmm. um which is one of the reasons why I came to Temple and like at first everything was good and dandy and then I would get into my honors classes and it was basically like I was back in fourth grade again mm -hmm. um always being the only black person in the classroom once again um sometimes there would be another black individual but I was probably still the only black female which made it even worse so as you can see this is something that young black girls have unfortunately experienced throughout their lives being able to remember early instances of misogynoir is a very common thing going home to tell their moms that they want to straighten their hair or in even more extreme cases take lightning creams to lighten their skin we're taught to hate our skin our features and our hair from bullying by peers and the media we consume Funnily enough, we are now in an age of blackfishing where non-black people are emulating black people, mainly black women, through over tanning and adopting black hairstyles. Now for some, they're like, it's just hair. But it isn't just hair when it's rooted in history and the very same people who are the originators for said styles aren't even appreciated. It reminds me of when Zendaya, a prominent black actress, had locks in her hair and Juliana Rancic, a media personality, made a comment that Zendaya looked like she smelled like, quote, weed and patchouli oil, unquote. Although Rancic apologized for her comments to Zendaya, who was still a teenager at the time, it shows that even the most prominent stars are subjected to this targeted speech. Now, we see locks being used on the runway, in editorials, and as fashion pieces, signifying how when it is on black people, it is unkempt and unprofessional, but on others, it is urban and fashionable. Okay, so I would say um, there was a moment when I was in 10th grade where a teacher was doing roll call and she was trying to say my name. And rather than just trying to phonetically say my name based off of how it's written, she called me Zimbabwe. Um, and at first, nobody in the classroom really knew who she was trying to call on, but then I realized I'm the only person in the room whose name begins with Z. So I raised my hand and asked her if she was asking for me, Zainab. And she said yes. Um, I had had this teacher for a year at this point too, so it's kind of like, sis, you know my name. Like, of all things that you could have called me, Zimbabwe. Um, also because of the fact that there's other Z names out there. You could have called me Zoe. You could have called me Zaria. <laughs> but you called me Zimbabwe. Like, when I went home and I told my mom the, um, the story of what happened, she was very mad. Like, she almost went to the principal and, like, made a huge thing out of it. But I kind of just let her, let her let it go. Um, but I do always wonder, like, if I wasn't black, would you have called me Zimbabwe? Mm. Like, would that have been your first guess? Mm -hmm. Probably not. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so, like I said, it was, like, definitely, like, people asking me, can I touch your hair? But maybe, like, another example I can give. I remember being in sixth grade and I joined my school swim team. And let me tell you right now, I do not like swimming. Like, <laughs> I don't know why I did it. I think it's because all my other friends wanted to do it. And I was like, sure, why not? Like, this would be cool, this would be fun. And I remember being on the bus because we'd be bus from our school to the swim facility. And I remember being on the bus and my hair was in cornrows. And one of the older kids were like making jokes at me. Like, oh, look at your hair, that's all that's. And they were saying like, like, that's for nigga dudes, like, you know how, like, they didn't, like, people, some white people have no problem saying nigga because they feel like, you know, it's in the song, like, whatever, it's, it's just a song, you know, if they don't understand that how, how much it's, like, like, you, like, you'll hear white people say nigga, and you know, like, sometimes they don't mean it in the way that, you know, they don't understand, like, some people just don't understand, but they're like, bro, your hair's like a nigga, bro, like, I was in sixth grade, like, they're mm -hmm. like, you look like a bro, like, you, you look like a nigga, bro, like, I was, in, I was a sixth grade girl, like, like, I'll never forget that. That mm -hmm. was the first time, like, that is a memory that I will never, ever forget. I, if I ever saw this kid today, like, I know exactly who he is, like, like, I remember that so vividly. Yeah. Just a, a little, it was like a white, like, 
a white boy. Like, he must have been in, like, seventh grade. I was in sixth. Like, ain't know how people are in middle school, but still. Like, yeah. at that age, you're old enough. To know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think when it was, like, so... I remember there was... There was a guy that I was... I thought I was friends with. I didn't even like this guy. And we were... We were, like, standing in line in the lunch line, and one of his friends said something that we would be cute together. And he's like, oh, I don't like black girls. But, like, just, like, outright, like, just blatantly, really. And I was like, oh, I, I didn't even like you, first off. But also, that was, you know, really hurtful. Um, so that was, like, the blatant one, but that was freshman year. Uh, before that, I don't think there was anything when I was younger that was so blatant where you could say it was like, I don't think these people really thought they were saying anything racist or mm -hmm. had any prejudice. It was just, you were excluded, you know? And when you were in the group, you didn't feel like you were part of the group. High school, um, no, not even high school, middle school, when the teacher's like, I need four strong boys to help me with the chairs. It was like, well, I'm strong. It doesn't have to be a boy. It can be a girl that can lift the chairs and help you move it. And she'd be like, no, Tiana, just sit down with the boys handle it. And I'm like, but can't girls help move things and lift heavy things also? And she was like, I mean, you can, but I just want the boys to do it. I'm like, it's not just meant for the boys to do heavy work, like let the girls do it too. A lot of people don't see me as black hmm. and I'm like, I'm black. But like, since I don't look like the stereotypical black girl, people don't think I'm black at all. And like, I remember one time there was this one boy in my class and he was like, Sierra, you're black. I was like, yeah. He said, I'm not going to believe you. Like, you know, you're not black. Like, he really said that I think you're Spanish. You're Spanish or like you're Indian or something, but you're not black. And that made me feel some type of way because I'm like, I know I'm black. I know that like my family's black. Like, of course, I have like, you know, mixture like in my family like I have a biracial grandmother but I'm black <laughs> like at the end of the day I'm not mixed with half and half of anything. Mm -hmm. Misogynoir is not only in reference to looks it happens in all aspects of life most prominent in medicine. Black women are less likely to have their medical concerns taken seriously because as women we're viewed as exaggerating our symptoms and as black people we're seen to be able to endure pain at a higher threshold compared to our counterparts, which is rooted in decades of eugenics, but that's for another time. When it comes to childbirth, black women unfortunately have a higher mortality rate compared to non-black women. There have been stories in the news and in social media of husbands and families recounting experiences where the mothers of their children have passed due to malpractice. My wife, Kira Dixon Johnson, was the closest thing that I'd ever met to a superhero. She made me far better than I ever thought I could be, and she was far better than I ever deserved. We're talking about a woman that ran marathons, that raced cars, that spoke five languages fluently. So we were blessed to welcome our first son, Charles, on September 18th of 2014. Um, we always wanted back-to-back -back boys, and we were blessed to find out that we were welcome, gonna welcome our second son, Langston, in April of 2016. We walked into Cedar sinai Medical Center on April 12th of 2016 with a woman that just wasn't in good health, she was in exceptional health. We went in for what was supposed to be a routine scheduled C-section on what was supposed to be the happiest day of our lives and we walked right into what was a nightmare. Shortly after the procedure took place around two o'clock, shortly afterwards, we went back to recovery. As I'm sitting there reflecting in all this glow and pride of being a new father for the second time, here is resting, my new baby is resting. And as I look at her bedside, I begin to see the catheter begin to turn red with blood. I brought it to the attention of the staff, the nurses at Cedar sinai they came in. They said, we're gonna do a couple of things. We're gonna order a set of tests, and we're gonna order a CT scan to be performed stat. I was concerned, but I, used, I said, you know what? My wife is healthy and we're supposed to be, what's supposed to be one of the best hospitals in the world. I'm concerned, but we've got a plan, okay? Blood work comes back, it's showing that it's abnormal and she's hemorrhaging. And they ordered a CT scan that was supposed to be performed stat. Keep in mind, this is around four o'clock. Five o'clock comes, no CT scan. Her, con her blood levels are continuing to drop. By this time, she's beginning to shiver uncontrollably. Six o'clock, no CT scan. She's, becoming to be, she's beginning to become pale. 
She's in extreme pain. Seven o'clock comes, eight o'clock comes, no CT scan. I'm begging, I'm pleading the staff to do something. And around nine o'clock, as I continue to plead for my wife's life, the staff at Cedar sinai Medical Center tells me, sir, your wife just isn't a priority right now. Eight o'clock comes, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. They say, well, we need to do a blood transfusion. I'm saying, well, where is the CT scan? It wasn't until after midnight that they finally took my wife back to surgery. After I'd begged and pleaded for them to take action for more than 10 hours. When they took Kira back to surgery, they opened her up and there were three and a half liters of blood in her abdomen. And she coded immediately. Now I'm here to tell you this. I'm not here to tell you what I think. I'm here to tell you what I know. There are people on this panel that are far more intelligent than I'll ever be that are going to talk to you about the statistics and how horrifying they are. What I'm here to tell you is this, is there's no statistic that can quantify what it's like to tell an 18-month-old that his mother's never coming home. There's no matrices that can quantify what it's like to explain to a son that will never know his mother just how amazing she was. My wife deserved better. Women all over this country deserve better. Now, you all may be thinking after watching all of this really sad stuff, dang Hafiza, why you got us all sad here? Now, while I understand that that is a solid reaction to the things that you may have just heard, I want to let you know that it is not all dark and gloom. Yes, that is currently happening. Yes, that is our past. But right now, there's a lot being done, not only to combat misogynoir, but to create spaces in which Black girls and Black women feel comfortable to be their authentic selves and to push the upliftment of their voices in all aspects of life and society. So... I, see, I definitely have seen a change, like especially like on social media. There's like a lot of like um, black YouTubers and like Instagram like models or whatever, and like they're not necessarily like models, but they're like a influencer on Instagram. And I see where they really promote like you know like black girl magic basically, and like even if it's through like there's travels or stuff they do like doctors like some of them are like doctors and they like share their stories or whatever and like talk about different things like they're doing it's just like i see that all throughout social media it's not one specific thing but i see it through different influencers and different people doing different things as like being black women that are really like amazing and is showing us that we could do it too you know and it's just not we have to do this one thing or do this thing because everybody else is doing it. it's like literally unique stuff that they're doing with their lives and promoting that in unique ways i've seen a lot of artists like i truly truly wish that um the representation that girls are just black females in general get in the media today. I wish that that was there when I was a kid because it definitely would have changed my perspective on my blackness, on my Africanness in general, um, and just made me more grounded and more confident in it. Like I really do hate that it took me getting all the way into college to actually like really truly appreciate it. And I always kind of wonder like, what would you have been like today if you were more confident in that sooner at an earlier age? Um, my kids are gonna definitely be blasting them brown skin girl they will know that song <laughs> <laughs> word for word and when they're feeling down we're gonna play that and jam to that in the car like i really wish that little things like that were definitely out there when i was a kid because yeah. it definitely would have made a big difference um when i was younger i feel like there definitely wasn't a lot of black women on tv or like in kids shows and whatnot and if they were they were like the token black girl you know what i mean mm-hmm. like now i feel like like we have a black girl being the little mermaid like (laughs) like that's fantastic you know we have black girls that are like the leads of shows not because like you know like it's like even like a black sitcom per se you know but like it's a regular show with regular people and a regular idea you know and the show's not about her being black it's Mm -hmm. about it's about any other show it's just a black girl's playing that was me with casey undercover i loved Zendaya yes. and Casey Undercover. It yes, because there's like any other regular like show but a black girl. And that's mm-hmm. nice, you know? Because it doesn't have to be 
while it's nice to see shows and like movies and things that are centered towards black people and like you know just for the culture you know what i mean like specifically for us it's nice to see like regular stuff that has nothing to do with being black it's just that we're gonna work people and this is what it is you know mm -hmm. it's nice um i think i think like the film and tv series definitely come a long way and magazines i think there's still work to do but i remember when i was younger when i was like 12 i couldn't see anyone that looked like me anywhere um or that had like my hair but now i see more of that i just watched a tv show it was called the um, it's a sci-fi show called The Feed, huh. and it had um, like a lot of the main characters were black, black women, um, black men, and these were like regular characters, you know, like they all had different personalities, these weren't stereotype characters and whatnot, and that really made me happy. So I think there's more representation coming out, more diversity. Um, I think entertainment, with the push of social media, there's been like a push to have this. Um, I see more of myself around. We have started creating initiatives to recognize the power that black girls and women hold within themselves. We are leading ladies in TV shows, in movies, and in music, perfecting our craft and sharing it with the world to see us in a more diverse light. Homages from Solange's Don't Touch My Hair and her sister Beyonce's Brown Skin Girl and Formation illustrate that no longer will we accept the notion that we are inferior. We are taking back the power to share our stories. I would say, I think my most beautiful feature is, I guess, just my humor. Um, I used to be very, like, strict and sharing just about, like, everything, but now I just take every day as it is. And you kind of, like, as you get older, you just learn that you have to take any moment or any experience that happens to you and just make the best of it and make light of it. Um, so like my entire family will say like I am always just taking even moments where it might not be appropriate to laugh or to have any happy moments I just try to make the best of it um, which is something that I think is a good quality to have mm -hmm. oh. um, uh, I think maybe my smile I don't know you I've, been told, <laughs> I've been told I have a nice smile a few times so <laughs> so maybe that I don't know. I was okay. This is, this has nothing to do with like skin color or anything, but like my pinkies because they're so <laughs> big. It sounds funny, but like I used to get picked on like so much over my pinkies because they're mm -hmm. like different from everybody else's. So like I just learned to love them because like my dad has them, like me, and my dad has them. So it's like something with like my dad. So that's like a feature. But want to like, show your pinky? <laughs> I mean, I guess this is my crooked pinky. Hey guys, yeah, <laughs> beautiful pinky. Yes, <laughs> but yeah. So that's like my like feature that I love about myself. Like you, overall, like I love who I am and what I look like. Like I'll always like love myself for who I am. I don't, I don't want to look like anybody else. Like I don't wish I had like bigger lips, like this like bigger eyes or whatever. Because my eyes are like tiny. Like I just love myself from who I am. Mm -hmm. And that's like the most important thing, especially with being Um I like my lips. I like mine too. <laughs> I would say my hair. I feel like not because it's become like a trend in the past years, but like I used to straighten my hair out because I just felt that like I wanted to look the other way for my curls. When no, my hair is curly and it's pretty and it's not What's the word that people used? Unkept or nappy? Like, no, it's curlilicious. That's what it is. <laughs> okay. Um. We are gracing the stage and taking crowns. We are on the covers of magazines. We are breaking into spaces and creating our own. As we continue to move forward, we should also remember the Black women in our lives, both present and past, and the support and foundations they've laid out to get us this far. I, this is probably a cliche answer, but like, honestly, it's going to be my mom. So I'm going to name two. Mm -hmm. So one, I'm going to say my mother. Oh no. <laughs> so I, I have this cliche, you know, family members, you know, but I'll say like my nanny. It's a cliche. It's my mom. <laughs> um, 
when my dad was like, I need to divorce you. And I was like, okay. So before that, they had gone to Italy and he got her like a $30,000 raid. She went and sold it to help pay for, you know, medical bills, the car payment. And I was just like, wow, like she's really putting her kids before herself first, but also like she knows what she has to do. And like divorce is a scary thing, even like in any aspect, but like for her, she was like, okay, what do I gotta do? And she did what she had to do. And I think that that's very admirable of her. Cause she is, she went through like a rough time growing up and she's biracial and but she claimed like she's like mixed but she know like she takes pride in that black side of her which i really love because she even like she said like growing up in an all-black community she had a hard time with dealing with that because she doesn't look black like she like, she'll pass for white but like she knows she's black deep down inside and like her hearing her story and stuff she had to go through and like her brothers and her dad, what they had to go through being like a black, you know, family. It's just like, it's just amazing. And especially since she grew up in a time where segregation was still taking place. Mm -hmm. So I'll say my nanny for sure. Cause like, she literally has that attitude. Like, you're not going to tell me who I am. I am <laughs> Darlene and I'm always going to be Darlene. Like, <laughs> I love that about her because she is Darlene and she will show that no matter what. <laughs> she would not change her personality for nobody. Like, And I love that about her. Definitely my mom. I feel like she had kind of, I feel like every black woman goes through the same thing. And I think to some extent, you know, you can maybe not, I call it, it's kind of like a cycle. And, and sometimes you can stay in the cycle for a long time. You cannot come out of it until you're like 50 or were really old, but I feel like my mom had embraced herself more mm -hmm. and I was ready to embrace myself. I had someone there that I could look up to and was there to help me and was patient with me too when I was like begging to straighten my hair or um, was just patient with me when I was just going through a lot of stuff. Yeah. She Coming from another country, she she's from Haiti originally. Coming from another country, she had to assimilate to a culture that was completely different. And she knew that. And when I was born and raised in America, she knew how to treat me, like how to raise me, knowing who I was and giving me the advice I needed to prosper. And I think without her, I would not be the woman I am today, like 100%. That's my number one like role model, my idol, the one who's taught me everything. Um, someone who's taught me to be proud of who I am, you know? And secondly, like a celebrity idol figure, it's gotta be Beyonce. <laughs> My girl Beyonce. When she dropped Lemonade, like, mm. that was a that was a Black Empowerment album. I'm gonna be referencing that in my video. Yeah, that was, that was a, that was an album that empowered Black women. Like, like, she talked about, you know, I got hot sauce in my bag. So, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, in, in the, the documentary, like the video, doc, the video series for Lemonade, it was black women. You know what I'm saying? In the, in her Coachella performance, it was black women. It was an, an homage to black fraternity and sorority culture. You know what I'm saying? Like, she has done such a good job for the promotion of black people without like doing it in a sense of, oh yeah, she's doing it for money. Cause you know, some people will do it for money. Like Period. they do it for money. It's a sad case, but Beyonce has done it in such a way where it's like, not only has she empowered black women, she's educated non-black women while doing it, you know? And made them feel good too. Because while Lemonade was a black women empowerment album, everybody bumps to it. Everybody yeah. can feel good to it, you know? I just think she's done such a good job at being herself and like through her years of career you can see how she advances you know because not she's not always had this platform she's not always been beyonce you know what i mean like she's been beyonce Knowles, but she's beyonce now you know her name you know what she stands for mm -hmm. and i feel like that's really important you know so my mom has definitely taught me especially getting older when you're able to have like more in-depth conversations and nothing has to be filtered she's definitely taught me not to take any nonsense from anybody whether mm. it be somebody that's the same color as me or somebody that is not the same color as me um because she also 
obviously has lived through um, just experiences of like being put down because of the fact that you're a black woman or being told that you're not supposed to be able to do stuff um, just because you're a black woman. Um, my mom was like very like education centered. She just recently got her um, doctorate. So like seeing stuff like that and just seeing her attack stuff and like be in leadership positions where sometimes people will try to undermine her authority because of the fact that she's a black female. Just seeing how she kind of goes about that and shows like, don't take that from them. Like you are who you are and you should know that and they should know that too. Um, it's definitely inspired me to kind of like keep on pushing forward and not be afraid to like explore the possibilities out there just because of the fact that you're not technically supposed to be doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, definitely my mommy, shout yeah. out to her. <laughs> we are first ladies, we are royalty, we are athletes, we are musicians, we are actresses, we are boss women, and we are here. There is work to be done, but at the end of the day, we are killing it, and we will continue to do so. Um, if nine-year-old me knew that today, everybody would be walking around with that shiki, and want to be wearing Akira, want to be listening to Afrobeats, want to be tasting jollof rice. Like, if I would have known that that's what it would have been like in 2020, I would have been screaming it down the block to everybody that I was Nigerian and telling them, come to my house, come get some food, come listen to this music, come to the parties with us. Um, I was just very scared to share that with people as a kid. Like, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> I always ask my mom, like, can I bring this food to school? And she'd be like, no. That's why right. people don't know. I'm just right. like, like, I just want to eat my food and okra, please. Like, 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 no meat. <laughs> Shouldn't eat meat with your hands at school. I know, you just got a fork and a knife cutting the beef. Like, what? <laughs> Once I was in high school, I was like, F that. Um, you're gonna take it as is. So. Yeah, if you want some? Do you want some? <laughs> you want some? <laughs> yeah. And I think I've realized that. To fit in, you don't have to be like everybody else. To fit in, like, in my opinion, is just being happy with yourself. And like, cause once you're happy with yourself and once you're confident with yourself, like I think you'll flourish better. And accepting my blackness was one of the, I think that's why I have so much confidence today. Like being mm. happy with myself. And that's why like, I had the confidence and like, am happy with who I am. Yeah. Any last words that you want to share or anything like that? Stay you, stay beautiful, and I'll catch you later. <laughs> <laughs>